YouTube, welcome, welcome. Good to see you. Lakeside Family Church, we are in a series. Are, are you blessed this morning? It's a, quiet, it's a quiet crowd today. Should we just, should we just cut now and just go, go uh, eat or something, go out, go out to lunch? Um, all right. So it's good to see you. We're in a series called Impact, and uh, we're talking about the impact that Christianity has had on the world. Um, sometimes... Uh, you, you have probably heard it said that, you know, we'd be a lot better off had Jesus never come. Uh, we'd be a lot better off without the church. Um, Christians are, are a big problem, and, and you know, we, we would all just be better off if that wasn't the case. Um, and so we're kind of addressing what, were, what would the world be like if Jesus had never come? And what would the world be like had the impact of his disciples, his followers, the church, um, never happened if uh, a world without the church. It's, a little, it's kind of a weird uh, subject matter. It's, it, it has been dark sometimes, yeah. We talk about the, the value of human life. I think week one, we talked about the value of human life and how uh, life was considered uh, really, really cheap. Uh, we tried to brighten it up the following week and not be so grim. Um, and just talk about death all the time. Uh, then week three, we kind of return to all the death and all the gloom and all the how horrible things would be. And, uh, and so you're, you're just in time because we, we have to be a little happier today. Um, the reality is that even those that criticize the church, even those that aren't big fans of Jesus, uh, if they really knew the whole story, would be and should be grateful for the impact of the body of Christ on the church, or uh, the body of Christ on the world. A couple things I want to just say quickly, um, and that is that we're not suggesting that the church or all Christians are perfect. I think we, t we touched on that last week. We're not saying that uh, the church has never been, and when I say the church, I mean the body of Christ, like over 2,000 years worth of disciples of Jesus. We're not saying that we've always been perfect, uh, but we're saying that overall, and I would say by a degree that I can't even begin to imagine, the world is far better off, despite you know, some of the mistakes that the body of Christ has made along the way. And let me say uh, also this, this morning, that, that we're also not saying that there's never been a non-Christian that has contributed anything meaningful to the world, all right? That's, I think that's really important to understand this morning. Um, Maybe not in this room, maybe, uh, maybe not those that are watching this online, but um, I don't want to give the impression that Christians are the only valuable people that have ever done anything meaningful in the history of the universe, and um, no one else has ever done you know, anything meaningful. That's not what this series is. However, this series is about the world would be a vastly different place without the church. And those that say we'd be better off without the influence of Christians, we'd be better off if there were no more Christians, don't recognize it. We're helping even believers to recognize uh, the impact that our community, the body of Christ, has had on the world. So we're way better off um, with the church. So this will be a fun one this morning. Um, it might be difficult. I just, this morning, I was giving myself a little pep talk and I said to myself, and I'll, I'll say this to you, we can't cover all of this. There's part of me that, that uh, you know, I caught myself this time um, trying to lay out the greatest case I can for what I want to share with you this morning. And um, I, I told myself both last night and this morning, like, you can't, you can't cover all of it. You just can't do it. You're going to have to leave some big gaps. You're going to have to leave some, you're going to have to leave some things for them to look up uh, on their own a little bit later. So... Let's just, let's just begin with that, that um, I will not begin to, to really scratch the surface of, this, of the subject matter that we're dealing with this morning. Did I tell you what it is yet? Tell you what we're talking about? All right, we're talking about the contribution of the church, the body of Christ, of Christians to science, right? Uh, I'm excited about this because a great many people think or have come to believe that science and the Bible or science and Christians are at odds with one another. Anybody ever heard that before? Yeah. 
that you can't really be a Christian and believe science, or you can't, if you really believe science, you really can't be a Christian. And I want to submit to you right here at the beginning this morning that there really would be no such thing as what we would call modern science without the body of Christ, without Christians. I'm going to say this one more time so I don't have to repeat it throughout the rest of the message. Um, and a grateful nation is, you know, thankful for that. Um, that's not to say that no one else ever did anything. Um, but it is saying that, that without Christians, there would not be um, the explosion of technology and science uh, that we know today. So Christianity and science are certainly not incompatible. That is... Um, a, a, a fallacy. Alfred North Whitehead, uh, a widely respected mathematician and philosopher, stressed uh, that modern science was born out of the Christian worldview. Whitehead, in his book uh, in 1925, said that, uh, t entitled Science and the Modern World, he said that Christianity is the mother of science because of the, quote, medieval insistence on the rationality of God. That's huge, the rationality of God, the medieval insistence on the rationality of God. A little bit more on that later. And I found, I thought this was interesting. So there are those that are, you know, ecologically minded, um, concerned about atmosphere and the earth and, and, and that kind of thing. And some, certainly not all, but some of the ecologically minded who are not believers um, have recognized the contribution that Christianity has made to science so much so that they blame Christians, right? We're destroying the world, the CO2 and global warming and, 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 and whatever else science and, te and technology and mankind has come up with that uh, the eco ecologically minded are concerned about. Uh, they, some of them are quick to point the finger at Christians. Even they recognize if there were no Christians, there would be no science, and we wouldn't have to worry so much about the earth. So when it's, uh, you know, uh, science versus Christians in, in some other sphere, well, you can't be really intelligent and scientific and believe in Christianity. And then when you, are, when you don't like science, uh, then you can blame us for that. So it's, it's tough for us to win in the eyes of the world. Come on, somebody, right? So we get no credit. And then we get all the blame. But it's interesting that there are even those that recognize, you know, if, if Christians didn't do these things, uh, we wouldn't have to be worried about the, the catastrophic end that's coming to the earth. If I said that in a snotty way, I didn't mean to. It was just subconscious. So, uh, all right. Um, so, right. Some of you are listening. Uh, all right. The origins of science. Let's talk about this. So, before... Jesus, about 600 years before Jesus, the Greek philosophers began to look for non-theological answers, non-religious answers to how the world works, right? So Greek philosophers, we owe them a great deal. And so they came up with some amazing things, things that, that we still use today. Um, they had some amazing and, and interesting discoveries, but uh, before Jesus, um, even Greek philosophy sought to understand some things, and that was, uh, that was a big deal. But, but they, they had no thought of changing the world, manipulating the world, or doing anything different with the world. They wanted to understand it. Um, you know, everything was sort of a mental exercise, but it never, it, it didn't translate to, hey, you know what, we should make an iPhone. Or, you know, whatever. So, right, so uh, we are indebted to um, some of the Greek philosophers. Maybe we'll talk about that. That might be some of the stuff that I have to cut um, this morning. But I don't want someone to say, well, what about the Greeks? Well, the Greeks played a role, but there was no scientific explosion as a result of Greek thinking. Now, Christians did uh, build upon some of the things that the, the Greeks came up with. All right. So the Greeks, uh, in their mind, the world was not to be changed. It was not to be used. It was simply to be understood. Dr. Malcolm Jeeves, in his book, The Scientific Enterprise and the Christian Faith, uh, points out a unique blend of Greek thinking and Christianity uh, and how that birthed modern science. Let's see. There's a long quote. Should I take the time? We'll, we'll, it's early. We'll still, 
uh, do it. I'll have to start trimming as we move along. I already recognize that. He said this, it was with the rediscovery of the Bible and of its message at, that, at the time of the Reformation that a new impetus came to the development of science. This new impetus, that's a weird word, I've only said that twice in my life and you just heard it, uh, flowing together with all that was the best in Greek thinking was to produce the right mixture to detonate the chain reaction leading to the explosion of knowledge which began at the start of the scientific revolution in the 16th century and which is proceeding with ever increasing momentum today. Did you catch that? Christians built upon some things that the Greeks had, um, but, but it, was, it was Christians that were responsible for uh, scientific revolution. And we'll, we'll get into more of the reasons why that is later. Okay, so I can't tell you all that stuff. You'll never, it's too early and I, even I'm bored with that. Okay, all right. So some will say, well, in the Islamic world, during the Middle Ages, they had some great advances. They invented algebra. How many of you are happy about the Arabics uh, 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 inventing algebra? We got one applause for algebra yeah. over there, right? So not such a big fan. It was okay when I was in school. It was okay when I was in school. Um, I'm pretty sure that the, the iPad and the, some of the technology that we're using here uh, this morning, that's pro there's probably some algebra involved there uh, somewhere. And I think it's interesting to note that um, Islamic nations were living better in the Middle Ages than, than Europeans, than the Christians, um, who were, it was pretty rough in Europe during the Middle Ages. So, um, so we don't want to take away from the Islamic world at that time. But even with the, the few discoveries and advancements that they had, um, there was still never anything really approaching what we might call a scientific age or what we would uh, consider to be modern science. There was still not an explosion of technology and, and knowledge and wisdom. So what we would consider science, nothing like that really happened in that part of the world. Now, the reason for that is, I uh, can't say for sure why they didn't do it, but uh, scholars have noted that there is something involved in the Islamic religion, a uh, uh, part of the theology of the Islamic religion is something called fatalism. Uh, maybe it sounds worse than it is. I don't know, it's still pretty bad. And, and fatalism is the idea that Allah, that everything is predetermined, that Allah has predetermined and, and things happen and move um, purely by his will. As believers, of course, God has a plan, God has a will, um, but he doesn't necessarily guide every step that your foot takes every day. He's not involved in everything that happens around the world. There's some free will and, and, uh, and, and, and so forth. But so understand in fatalism, Allah dictates everything. If, if, you know, when a certain, when that last leaf falls from the tree, anybody get anxious right then when I said that? You're like, oh, all the leaves, I've got to take care of all those, all those leaves. Um, when the last leaf finally falls, you know, Allah determines that. That's not, it's not, you know, they're not certain laws of nature that, that God set in place and, and just kind of set them off and, and they kind of operate according to his, uh, his, the laws that he gave them. So if Allah determines when each leaf falls from the tree, what's the point in discovering more about the world around us in such a way as to manipulate it? There, there doesn't seem to be much point in that. Allah's in, char Allah's in charge anyway. It doesn't really, doesn't really matter. Fatalism is probably one of the biggest reasons why. Um, so it was their theology that there was no scientific explosion in the Islamic world. Um, we could talk about animists. You go, I don't know what an animist is. If you go back a few years ago, I preached a really boring sermon. <laughs> Might have been a series on animism. I would ask, does anybody remember it? You might remember it because it was the most boring series we've ever done here at Lake Science. But it was fascinating. I thought it was fa it's just a fascinating idea. Um, but most people weren't ready for, for, ready for that. So an animist, think of like a tribal religion, right? Somebody cut off and they kind of like, let's invent a religion. And, uh, and so there's a lot of nature worship and ancestor worship and things like that. So um, science would not have risen and has never risen in, in animist 
um, cultures um, in tribal religions where there's a, a lot of superstition, where they worship nature, a lot of kind of occult uh, practices going on. Um, since everything, whether they were stones or trees or animals or anything else, um, contained living spirits. And so God was, um, or God is a part in that belief system. God is a part of everything. So you don't manipulate God. You don't play with God. You don't toy with God. You don't do experiments on God. You just sort of appease him or her or them and, and hope they don't get upset with you. <laughs> and it, by the way, that doesn't depend on their character. It just depends on, or your character, it just depends on their mood for that day. If the God wakes up in a grumpy mood, lightning bolts could get you, right? So um, history demonstrates that tribal religions didn't come up with many scientific breakthroughs. Um, it's also been noted that science did not come from what we would call modern science. Didn't, it's not that there was never, somebody didn't figure something out. Um, but what we would call real scientific revolution didn't occur in Asian countries either, like uh, India or China. India, um, where the primary um, belief system is uh, Hinduism. Um, China, uh, Buddhism, where some of the main teaching of those belief systems are is that one of the things that, uh, that is most real is that reality isn't real or the material world, or what you see, and what you touch, and what you feel, that's not real. Now, can anyone seriously not understand that if you believe that what we know as the material world is actually unreal, why would anyone ever seek to manipulate, to control it, to make discoveries? What, what, what would be the reason. And so there were no uh, great scientific breakthroughs or scientific revolutions that came out of those parts of the world. Um, do, you do, you follow, do you follow the preacher this morning? What I'm saying is that without Christianity and the impact of Christians, the world would be a much different place. Yeah, there's some other folks that, that did some, some fine things. Um, but we wouldn't be where we're at today. All right, let's move on. Um, what we considered, what we would consider modern science came in the 16th century, and it was because of a number of basic teachings in Christianity. All right, number one, Christians believed that the world was rational. So because Christians were monotheists, one God, um, we believe in the Trinity, but one God, that's a different sermon, all right, but one God. So I was talking about this the other day to someone. So the ancient world very often believed like there was the God of Stevensville. See, Allah willed me to trip on that palette right there. <laughs> was Allah's will. It wasn't just me being stupid um, and clumsy. Allah decided and you know, what he wants, that's what he's gonna do. There's no point in you know, avoiding the palette in the future. Um, what's gonna happen is what's going to happen. Um, so there's, you know, so the God of Stevensville, right? And so maybe we're worshipers of the God of Stevensville, and then there's the God of Bridgman, and there's the God of Baroda and St. Joe, right? Different, different uh, gods, different uh, temperaments, different, different personalities. And so what's true in Stevensville, if, if the God of Stevensville created Stevensville, or at least runs the show, um, then we might not expect things to work the same way in Stevensville as they do in Bridgman, Baroda, or, or St. Joe. Um, what would be the point in making discoveries if you couldn't rely on them, if, 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 if it wasn't dependable? You will remember that Uncle Vinny talked about, does a grit, does water soak into a grit faster on your stove? I really thought somebody would be with me on that. <laughs> than it does every other stove in the world. Vinny, Uncle Vinny, I'm staying here until somebody comes up with it. Jeffrey, my cousin Vinny, yeah. my Joe cousin Pesci, Vinny. Right? You don't remember? Yeah, Joe Pesci, right? Um, Vinny, right? When he, that was like, well, if you haven't seen it, but I don't want to ruin it. So, the, so there was a timeline situation. Why am I explaining this movie to you? Any, no one knows the grit soaking thing from, all right. 
They had to figure out the timeline. And he's like, do you have magic grits? Does water soak into a grit? Does it boil faster? Do grits are grits prepared magically on your stove differently than they are everywhere else in the world? And what Vinny was talking about, not that anyone here knows, uh, was what I'm talking about. You would expect if water soaks into a grit at a certain temperature in a certain way at a certain time in Stevensville, the same thing is true in Finland. We heard from some Finns this morning. Got a call. Uh, the same thing would be true in Brazil and China, right? The, the, the properties um, would be different if there were different gods in charge of the whole world. But Christianity taught uniquely, now the Jews had monotheism as well, um, that there was one God who made everything. So you could look at what took place in one, in one part of the world and, and you could make some assumptions about how that would operate in other parts of the world. So it was a rational God, right? Remember, many belief systems don't believe in a rational God. He or it is just a, a force, but there's not an intelligence, there's not a mind. He doesn't purpose and will and think and, and love. And, and so there would be no reason to think that the world was a rational place. It was just crazy, willy-nilly, whatever the gods want to do, that's what's going to happen. And Christians believe that one God made everything, that that God was rational, and therefore uh, creation um, was a, a rational creation, if I, can, if I can say it that way, and I think I just did. So um, Christians believe we live in a rational world, right? So because of that, it gave rise to the possibility of scientific laws. What's true in one place is probably true somewhere somewhere else. So science could not originate. Um, think about this. Science couldn't originate. You say, well, you know what? Eventually, we would have gotten there. Like, we didn't need Jesus. We didn't need his disciples. We didn't need Christians to get to this place. Um, we would have eventually came up with all the, the technology and all the modern conveniences that we enjoy. And I began to think about that. And I thought, well, you know, there's, a, there's this expression. This could get you grounded in my house. Um, no, no one, I don't think anybody's ever said it, but, and don't, we won't ask for a show of hands, but you've heard the expression, well, I just want to tell you my truth. You ever heard that? I hear some of you out there. Well, you know, you have your truth and this is my truth, right? Now, if you've ever said that, there is forgiveness for you in Jesus Christ. Jesus died for you so that you could be forgiven of statements like, you have your truth and I have my truth. I think what they, they changed the, the definition of the word. I think they mean opinion, perhaps. Um, but truth is, but that's the word. But like, we're, like I'm hearing that, I cringe every time I hear that expression. Um, but we're living in a world where there is an idea that there is truth for you and there's a different truth for me. You know, it was uh, maybe a foundation with some Greek philosophers, but Christianity built on that and said, you know what, there is, it's a rational world and there is, um, there is absolute truth in the world. We can predict things, we can, we can look at the world and we can, um, we can understand the world around us. Oh, by the way, also, Christians didn't believe that God was a part of his creation, as some belief systems do. Um, pantheism, that God is a part of the chair and a part of the rock and a part of the tree, so you don't do experiments on God. So God was not only rational, created a rational world and universe, but also he was separate and distinct from his creation. So you did no violence to God or the gods by experimenting with the world around us. He made it, he's rational, it's rational, but he is not a part of creation. So we can do experiments on the trees and on the rocks or whatever. By the way, you know the word Adam comes from a Greek word that means um, I'm trying to think of how, I didn't jot this down, but uh, it means like impossible to divide. <laughs> like that's the, that's the, that's what that word means, impossible to divide. Well, uh, we, we, I don't think we ought to rename it. That would make things confusing, but you get the idea. Um, but the, hey, that's just my truth. <laughs> <laughs> you say, well, you know, we would have had we would have had these advancements. We could have come along. We don't need the church for this stuff. 
you know, the, the, the little, uh, the, the, the small advances that we made in, in history, we would, have, we would have come to this point eventually. Uh, I'm not so sure about that because we live in a day where men can get pregnant. Now, I don't want to be rude, but the reality is that that's the world that we live in. And, 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 you know, if you didn't pick this up online, there was some laughter in the room. Uh, to a great many, the idea that men can be pregnant um, is laughable. But there are those, and we're seeing uh, perhaps an increase. Um, I'm wondering if the sun is setting on this idea. I'm hopeful anyway. Um, but we do see a great number of people that seriously believe that men can get pregnant. And by the way, if you don't believe that, you're a Neanderthal, you're a Cretan, um, you must be one of those Bible believers, right? You must be one of those crazy, crazy Christian anti-science people. Are you seeing mothers now being referred to as birthing parents? I can't wait. Maybe it's a Hallmark strategy. <laughs> Happy birthing parent day. <laughs> because mother, you know, isn't good enough. Now, so we're having fun with that uh, here this morning. But there's people that are buying into that. So when we talk about a rational world and rational thinking and logic, don't take for granted that that just comes from being a, a, a normal person living on the face of a rational earth. There are folks that don't believe those things. You've heard the expression that there are no absolute truths. I'll ask you a question this morning. Maybe Jim Fitchuk, you can't answer. Um, he's good with this. He's really good with this stuff, better than I am with this stuff. But if you hear the expression, there are no absolute truths, some of you will remember. What's your response when someone says, you know, there really are no absolute truths? You ask the question back, well, is that truth an absolute truth? In other words, not a, not a relative truth. Like some things are just true. Men can't have babies, right? Um, when someone says, well, there are no absolute truths, what they're saying is there's nothing that you can say for sure, that there's nothing that we can count on. There's nothing that's dependable. Rationality is out the window. We, we can't depend on being Rational. It sounds like a fun world to live in, right? So when someone says there are no absolute truths, your response is, is that truth an absolute truth? I didn't jot this down. I should have. I'm going to try to work this through in my mind in real time on the spot. If the expression, there are no absolute truths, is an absolute truth, then it's a self-defeating statement. Are, are you with me? I need you here because you need, might need to correct me, <laughs> right? The, the statement, there are no absolute truths. When someone says that, they are saying that as though that statement is always true all the time, under any circumstances, um, always true. And if the statement there are no absolute truths is an absolute truth, then it's self-defeating. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, all right, there's, so there's another way we can work this. If the statement there are no absolute truths is not an absolute truth, then that's a self-defeating statement. Yeah, Jim, help, help. Are you with me? I should have consulted you first. <laughs> if the expression, there are no absolute truths, what did, I, what did I even say? If that's not true, then that's a self-defeating statement because the statement says, okay, you get the idea, all right. All I want you to get from this is when someone says that, how you respond. <laughs> and, 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 you know, you have to be able to work through it. In other words, this is where I came up with my cousin, Vinny. Uh, if water boils at... 212 degrees today, it'll probably boil 212 degrees tomorrow. Next week, it's all willy-nilly, man. Who can say? <laughs> Who can say about next week? You know, 212 is the number. 
right? It's going to be consistent. It's going to be, all right. So why did Christians, how are Christians responsible for um, modern science? They believed in a rational world created by a rational God. All right, number two, let's, let's look at our scripture here this morning. Uh, Genesis 126, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let him rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock and over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. This is becoming um, one of my favorite scriptures. Every spring and summer, sometimes in the fall, I think of this scripture when I'm out working in the yard, right? Like I, I'm not like Jeff, I don't like winter. Um, it's okay at first, but it gets old really, really fast. Come on, somebody. If you've never amen before, you can probably amen right there. Like it gets old pretty fast, but at least we get a break from the work. Like, you know, uh, we still have to get out of the driveway. Um, but all the weeding, all the, all the mowing, all the, like that's, that's neat for a while. The mosquitoes, is, it is kind of nice to have a break as we enter this time of the year, right? But I think about this scripture, that God said that man was created in, in his image and that we are to rule over the fish, so the sea, the birds, the air, the livestock, and all the earth, all the creatures, and everything that moves along the ground. We are to have dominion is uh, the word often used to describe uh, this passage. And the command that God gave that, that humans are to have dominion and control and are to be, if, if I may, lords of this earth. And so Christians looked at that command and looked at that revelation right there in, in Genesis chapter 1 and said, you know, if Bible-believing people said, you know, if, if that's true, that we're supposed to rule and have dominion over these things, then, then, then we must seek out and find ways and better ways to do this. So that when I'm out doing my yard work, I'm thinking, what a biblical person I am. I'm out taking dominion. I'm killing these weeds. <laughs> I'm pulling them out, I'm chopping this grass down, and trying to kill things that yes. usually escape me. Um, but nevertheless, I'm trying to be a good Christian and take dominion over my yard. All right. But, but, but this is one reason. Christians looked at that and went, then we, we should be able to manipulate the world around us. It was their foundation in biblical truth that led them to some of their um, discoveries and some of their, their thinking with regards to science. Also, the doctrine of sin. Check this out. Early, uh, not early Christians, but Christians recognize that they're sinful, which means that I really can't be trusted. Like I can come up with this thing or I can come up with a theory or I can come up with this idea, but I'm broken, I'm fallen, and I'm prone to manipulation and not only being manipulated, but in manipulating others and falsifying my results and coming up with some things that I can use to my own advantage or maybe my own biases. And so Christians recognize maybe we should experiment and maybe we should, we should try to take our own thinking out of it because our own thinking may be flawed. And so we'll do you know, the scientific method. We'll take our own thinking and our, our own biases and as much as we can control that, we'll take that out of it because we are flawed as sinful human beings. Francis Bacon, uh, who is credited as developing the scientific method, said this, there are two books laid before us to study to prevent our falling into error. First, the volume of the scriptures, which reveal the will of God. Then the volume of the creatures, and he was talking about nature and the world around us, which express his power. So we look at the scriptures and we understand some things about God and ourselves and, and the spiritual realm. And then we look at nature and we understand things about God and ourselves and, and the spiritual realm. And so Francis Bacon was a, was a Bible believer and, uh, again, credited with uh, um, developing the scientific method. All right. Uh, I can skip this. Galileo, they had that whole story messed up. You can look that up. Um, the... Uh, the Roman church attacked Galileo, and he, you know, uh, had a trial. I'm trying to say it as briefly as I can. But what, what they, maybe I should just read it and take longer. It might take longer to do the long form than take the time to think of how to say it quickly. Um, they were mistaken about what Galileo and Copernicus were saying. They mistakenly thought that they were denying the scriptures when 
that actually was not the case. And Galileo, I believe, and Copernicus um, actually supported a biblical, uh, biblical cosmology. Um, so you can look, you know, I'll let you look that up for yourself. But Galileo didn't, it wasn't against the Bible. Copernicus didn't say anything against the Bible. It was a misunderstanding um, which caused his trial to come about. So, because people will use that and they'll say, Christians, you know, Christians tried to stop science. Well, there's a few folks that were confused about some things back then and attacked things that not because of their biblical um, foundation, but because they were confused about um, whether or not that was a biblical idea. Anyways, I don't know if you can figure that out. I'll leave it to you. You're Christians, so you ought to be able to figure out what I was just talking about. So wise, so smart. All right. Um, James Moore <laughs> writes that there is, quote, a distinct and plausible evidence that Protestantism uh, gave rise to modern science. Lutherans, Moore points out, uh, it was Lutherans uh, that in the 16th century were uh, responsible for promoting scientific uh, thinking and ideas and concepts, uh, Johannes Kepler um, being a part, and that helped pave the way for scientific development. And in the 17th century, it was the Calvinists who led the way. You remember we did, for At The Movies, we did the movie Luther? And I said, this is, look, I can't get into, but this is way more important than like, I'm trying to touch on what, what this caused, but it's, but it's way bigger than what we have time to go into. I don't know if you've noticed, if you've connected the dots, but more than once now, some of these quotes have connected modern science to the Reformation. Right, so Martin Luther goes, ah, maybe we're saved by grace through faith, and, and now you have a smartphone. <laughs> well, you know, how long do you, can, the ser- can the sermon possibly be, right? You know, um, but, but that's the idea. So I got some quotes from some, some big shots. Uh, Johannes Kepler, 1571, 1630, he said, when a scientist is engaged in the study of nature, he is looking for what laws God set up in nature. Did you hear it? It, it, That's a Christian perspective. God must have set up some laws that we can can, uh, reasonably expect to be reproduced. Um, That nobody thought of, nobody really thought of that. It's a biblical worldview that came up with that idea. He goes on to say, since we astronomers are priests of the highest God in regard to the book of nature, it benefits us to be thoughtful, not of the glory of our minds, but rather, above all else, the glory of God. Dumb Christians, anti-scientific Christians, um, superstitious Christians, Christians are anti-science. Um, it doesn't look like that with Johannes Kepler. Uh, how about Blaise Pascal? Anyone ever heard of him? We'll hear more from him in a moment. Um, he made uh, tremendous innovations in mathematics and probability science. I, I don't know what that is. I just wrote it down. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, kind of, I know a little bit. All right. Um, he was, but he was also a devout Christian. <gasps> Blaise Pascal, a Christian. How can it be? What crazy world was this? We're, we're Christians. We're scientists, right? Um, he wrote uh, a devotional book in defense of Christianity. And he wrote, faith tells us what senses cannot but it is not contrary to their findings. It simply transcends without contradicting them. He makes uh, a case for Christianity when he writes, Jesus Christ is the only proof of the living God. We only know God through Jesus Christ. Uh, See if we can, okay. He also points out that the knowledge that we have about God goes beyond what we can detect in our minds. The Christian's God does not merely consist of a God who is the author of mathematical truths and the order of the elements. That is the notion of the heathen and the Epicureans. But the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of the Christians, is a God of love and compassion. Oh, man, if those weird Christians didn't get involved in science, imagine how much further along we could be if these Christians hadn't inserted themselves into science. Quite the opposite, friends. All right, anybody ever heard of Isaac Newton? All right, Uh, he wrote a lot on science and theology. Uh, He was uh, well known uh, as a spiritual man, a pious man. Um, 
he professed and is, is um, documented as professing to believing in Jesus Christ and the message of salvation. He had a strong faith in God that is said to have undergirded his scientific worldview. Amazing or impossible to imagine uh, for some. He writes, Isaac Newton writes, the most beautiful system of the sun, the planets, the comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. The Bible wasn't a hindrance to science. The Bible was the reason for science. Now, some uh, humanists that aren't such big fans of the spiritual stuff lament the fact that towards the end of his life, Isaac Newton wrote more about theology and about the Lord and about salvation than he did about science. And so some people are like, oh, he wasted his time. With the, he could have been working on so much more important things. But to Isaac Newton, God was an important thing and, uh, and wrote extensively about um, his walk with God and his belief in God. Science and the Bible are not in conflict, friends. It was the Bible that gave rise to modern science. All right, Newton also said, I'm gonna give you a couple more things from Newton, then we'll, then we'll show a video here in just a minute. Uh, quick, quick video. Um, Newton also said, I have a foundational belief in the Bible as the word of God, written by men who were inspired by God. He went on to say, I study the Bible daily. I love that. Uh, we'll, we'll throw in this one here, too. Um, he also said, atheism is so senseless. Isaac Newton, he knew a thing or two. Isaac Newton said, atheism is so senseless. When I look at the solar system, I see the, the earth at the right distance from the sun to receive the proper amounts of heat and light. This did not happen by chance. All right, there's, uh, I, I have Michael Faraday. Um, down here as well, but I'll skip him. Should I skip Faraday? Any Faraday fans? We like Faraday? All right, we got just a couple things on Faraday. You know Faraday? All right. Um, Faraday made his greatest contributions in the study of electricity. He discovered electromagnetic induction and invented the generator. Jeff can explain electromagnetic induction to us later. Uh, Faraday belonged to a Christian fellowship group of scientists whose position was, their formal position was, quote, where the scriptures speak, we speak. Where the scriptures are silent, we are silent. He was an active member in his church and is reported to have had a strong and abiding faith in the Bible and in prayer. Okay, so there are no scientists that are Christians. So we'll show you this uh, short video of each one of these individuals listed is a Christian and they're founders of these particular fields of science. They're not just practitioners. They founded these fields of science. Likely without them or some other Christian, these fields of science would not exist. Let's hit it.
Aha, tricked you. All right, all Christians, all Bible believers, all found it. You know, I have to get up earlier. You see, some, some of them founded more than one field of science. How many fields of science have you started? I haven't even, I haven't even started one. What a loser. <laughs> some of these guys are showing up on this list one, two, three times. Uh, I, 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 I'm so convicted. I just I gotta, I gotta get up earlier or something. I haven't found it any. Until I found my own field of science, it's not, I'm just not going to. That's a terrible idea. Uh, but you get the idea, right? So, so many. So I wanted to just, some of, to some of you, you've heard this before. Um, some of you, this may be new information. Again, I tried to skim over the surface and just give you an idea. When we hear someone say that the Bible and science are incompatible or the Christians are a bunch of superstitious um, you know, superstitious folks that uh, un unintelligent and superstitious. Um, I hope that you recognize and, and maybe you can answer with some of what we've given you here this morning. That is indeed not the case. And had there not been a church, had there not been disciples of Christ and had Jesus never been born, um, it would be a darker place. Literally a darker place. <laughs> You know, right? Okay, you got. It. This is a good crowd. You got it. All right. Um, all right. Uh, we'll we'll close there. And uh, I'm grateful for those uh, those folks that went before us and gave us the conveniences that we enjoy. I saw the show one time. Not a part of the message, but I saw the show one time. It was um, I don't. Know, it said something like inventions that changed the world. And you know, one time everybody wanted to live. In, uh, in the United States anyway, in the northern United States, because heat was awful, it was terrible, and you can light a fire and that, you know, that fixes a whole lot. And like people didn't, the South was horrible, that's where you lived if you had nowhere else to go. Uh, then we invented air conditioning. And everybody wants to live in the South, right? Like, ah, you know, this snow stuff is, uh, Awful, and so we'll go. To, but if there were no air conditioning, I try to remind myself of that sometimes. Like, if there were no air conditioning. I live in heaven. I live in the most beautiful, in the most perfect spot, perhaps on the face of the planet. But there is air conditioning, and it is. I like, I like, I like warm weather. But but that's something that that humans did and made the world a different and a better place. I don't know about you. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, no one's coming up. Are we gonna let's come up for uh, let's close with a song. All right, I thought you guys would come up. Um, and uh, all right, that was a lot to that was a lot to take in. And.